Okay, hi everyone. Uh, welcome to the first of nine nights of uh, review for the AP US government exam. Uh, my name is Paul Sargent and uh, we find ourselves in kind of a weird situation this year. You know, we've got this uh, AP exam, which is going to be different from uh, any AP exam that they've ever given before and in, a, in a course which has been sort of cut short. Um, and so over the course of the next night, nine nights, thanks to the Bill of Rights Institute, I'm going to uh, try and get you the information that you need to be able to, uh, to, to do well on this exam. And understand what's going on. I'm gonna go through the main concepts of the course um, and, uh, and and sort of walk you through what it is, you know, the big ideas and, and the things that you need to know. Um, I've been teaching this course for 13 years. Um, so I know a little bit about AP government um, and uh, I hope you're able to tune in uh, every night or at least the nights that you guys are uh, seeing things, seeing topics that you need. So tonight, our topic is going to be the very beginning. It's going to be all about the Constitution. It's all going to be about how our government was formed and what the Constitution, uh, the principles of the Constitution, all that uh, are all about. So I'm going to go ahead here and share uh, my screen and uh, give you guys this. There should be a link to um, a copy of this um, of this slideshow if you guys want to uh, kind of go along with it so that uh, you know you can see some of this and you can also uh, have access to it later um, to go over it. So yes, here it is, session one of nine, ladies and gentlemen, on the Constitution and democracy. All right, now before I get into this, what I like to do is just sort of like highlight some of the things they have. The Bill of Rights Institute website is a great place to go, especially when you're reviewing some of those uh, important documents and court cases that are going to be on the exam. They have tons and tons of resources here for you guys. Um, click on Engage for Students and you get to the stuff that they have. Um, it, it's some fantastic stuff. I also have a website. Um, it's sargentos.com. It doesn't have quite as much as the Bill of Rights Institute but it does have some good stuff on there. So if you're looking for more uh, information about uh, AP government that might help getting ready for the exam, this is another place that you can go. All right, so enough promoting. Let's dive into this whole constitution thing. Um, in the chat, by the way, you can ask questions um, and uh, those questions will be uh, sort of forwarded to me. Um, and uh, and I have to be able to see the chat here in order to uh, know what's going on. Let's see, hold on one second. And let me just stop this, make sure. Okay, I have the chat here. Okay. All right, we're gonna see how this goes. Uh, wait a minute, da, da, da. I'm sharing the screen. You can tell that I'm good at this stuff. All right, so we are sharing this screen and I'm gonna have to go, let's see if we can do this full screen and still get the, uh, the questions to come through, we'll see. Okay, so here's the big idea of this, okay? Um, the US Constitution arose out of important historical and philosophical ideas and preferences regarding popular sovereignty and limited government. These are some really big concepts that you really need to understand in order to sort of like get a grasp on, uh, on this course. Compromises were made during the Constitutional Convention and ratification debates. We'll talk about some of those tonight. And these compromises have frequently been the source of conflict in US politics over the proper balance between individual freedom, social order, and equality of opportunity. So this is gonna be the big idea that we're gonna deal with tonight and the big idea we're gonna deal with tomorrow night when we talk about federalism. And it's even one that we see playing out in front of us uh, on a daily basis today. Uh, and I'll sort of talk about how that, uh, how that looks, okay? So a few things that, the, that, uh, that, that we're gonna go over. Now this comes straight from the College Board. I really think it's a good idea to look at exactly what they say you should know, because if they're gonna tell you that you need to know it, it's probably a good idea for you to know it. So some essential questions. How did the founders of the US Constitution attempt to protect individual liberty while also promoting public order and safety. There's a trade-off there. When, is, when are you giving up too much of your freedom in order to be safe? 
when when states lock down uh, for uh, coronavirus and they, they issue stay at home orders. Um, obviously, there's safety involved, but obviously, it's also taking away personal freedom. And we see people protesting uh, in the streets of some cities right now about their right to have personal freedom uh, and not be uh, shut in at home. How have theory, debate, and compromise influenced the U.S. constitutional system? The compromise is really a, a, whole, a big part of this. And then how does the development and interpretation of the Constitution influence policies that impact citizens and residents of the United States? So how are we influenced um, by uh, you know, how this Constitution thing was developed? So let's get going here. Now, again, college boards are real good about this stuff. They don't hide much. They say, here's exactly what we want you to know. First of all, they want you to know that a balance between governmental power and individual rights has been a hallmark of American political development. And what you have here um, is you have students who are pro who are protesting the, um, the Vietnam War. Um, is their right to uh, free speech going to in, impede uh, or in, in a school setting? Is that going to impede on the safety of the school? And we'll actually talk about that. Uh, I think it's, gosh, um, maybe session seven or eight, something like that. OK, so let's get back to the ideological basis here, because there, there are big ideas that you, that, that you really have to understand. This man here is John Locke. You've probably heard of him. He came up with, with what's known as the social contract theory. Um, and the ideological basis of the American system starts with limited government. It's an idea that which at the time was fairly unique because most countries were run by kings, monarchs, um, who had unlimited authority. They could do whatever they wanted to, wanted to and they could make anything happen that they wanted to. Um, system is really based on a limited government, which with strict limits on what it can do. It also has the, the ideology of natural rights, the idea that there are rights which um, are, are given to man, which are above the laws of man, um, you know, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness uh, kind of things, or as John Locke put it, life, liberty, and property. Um, also, the idea of popular sovereignty is really big, that the people are the ultimate rulers of, uh, or the also ultimate source of the authority, that, that the people give power to the government. Um, and then, as Thomas Jefferson put it, if they find the government isn't protecting their natural rights, then they can take that power uh, back and put in a government which will. Republicanism. The idea of having a republic where there are elected representatives for the people who make the decisions um, for us. It is much easier that way. I would not want to vote on every single law that comes before Congress. That would just be a little bit too much. And then the social contract. The idea that, that government is based on a contract between the people and the government, where the people are willing to give up some of their freedom in exchange for uh, the government's protection and many other benefits of being part uh, you know, of a society under a strong government. So those are like the five big ideologies which, uh, which kind of uh, run uh, over this. So we're gonna go way, way back to, uh, 1973, to 1776. Now, as you can see, I'm here actually in Philadelphia um, in front of Independence Hall, it's right in this building right here behind me where the Declaration of Independence was signed um, after it was debated and all of that. This is one of those foundational documents that you need to be familiar with. Um, you need to be familiar with the ideals in it um, and especially the ideals that come at the beginning. You know, the, 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 the um, part that Thomas Jefferson puts out sort of the ideology of America. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. Ironic that this is written by a slave owner, but we'll, leave, we'll save that for the AP US history discussion, okay? That they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, but among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. There's that natural rights thing I was just talking about. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness given to them. That to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. And that last part there um, has not only the, the idea of the popular sovereignty, P 
people give um, consent to be governed, but also um, the idea of the social contract, that, that this is uh, sort of a, a two-way street, really. All right. Um, now, that set up the ideological basis, but of course, creating an actual government, there's no government created in the Declaration of Independence. In fact, I always tell my students, it's a good sort of shorthand way to think of it, but the Declaration of Independence is like a really formal breakup letter. Um, and it's saying, hey, we really, it's been great being part of uh, Britain. We've had some complaints. We're gonna list them all for you, but like, we're done, okay? And we're just gonna part ways and like, hopefully it'll be cool. It wasn't cool, they fought a war. Um, and thanks to the help of the French and the Spanish, we were able to win it. And then got down to the business of creating uh, like a new government, which was actually going to run. But before the constitution came along, um, I guess I have these in sort of an odd order here, but we'll go with it. The Constitution lays out its uh, premise for how the government of the United States is going to be set up in, in the preamble here. We, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense. I mean, this, this they're getting pretty ambitious here. Promote the general welfare and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity. Do ordain and establish this constitution for the United States of America. I got to tell you on a personal note, uh, you know, I not, not only when I was a child, but even today, um, I, I remember that Schoolhouse Rocks video about the preamble of the Constitution. I cannot read those words without hearing that song in my head. And when I was a kid and I would have to, you know, write down the preamble because we had to do that at the time, the Constitution, I just sang the song in my head. In fact, the whole class did. It was kind of funny when everyone would just start humming it at the same time. Um, so anyway, so we get into sort of what is uh, the government here. Now, um, there is um, a, a uh, the, um, there is a uh, da, 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 da. Um, there is an idea about representative democracies. Um, I just got a question here about uh, uh, about any supplement FRQ or practice problems to work on. Um, I don't really have anything like that. There's some uh, things which are provided on uh, the College Board website, and that might be uh, that might be a place to look. Um, but I don't have anything like that, uh, which would, which can help. Um, so let's go through this here. Oh, how do I make this thing go away? There we go. Um, okay, so some types of representative democracies. Okay, there's a participatory democracy. So this means like lots of people are participating. Um, they're 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 involved in uh, all forms of of political uh, uh, participation. Um, there's a whole lot of it. Um, then uh, there's also a pluralist uh, form of representative democracy where you, really it's more groups, okay? So think like interest groups, political parties, those sorts of things. They're the ones who are gonna be more influencing uh, government policy uh, over that. And then there's elite representative democracies where really there are really only a few groups who really are able to get um, their voices heard inside of um, inside of a government. Um, the uh, and 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 people um, and people will kind of uh, argue over which is the the most. Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to do that. Um, which is the most uh, uh, descriptive of what we have? Uh, people will say that that the um, that the participatory is the main one, that um, that there are lots and lots of opportunities for people to uh, to participate and and all that. Some people will say, hey, only some uh, only some um, uh, groups actually get their voices heard. Hold on, I've got to I've, I've got to jump out of here for one second, um, and, uh, and and now I can go back in. Okay, all right. Um, so uh, then we then we move on here. Okay, so the second thing they want you to understand is that the Constitution emerged from the debate about the weaknesses in the Articles of Confederation as a blueprint for limited government. Now, hopefully, in your courses, you went through 
uh, the Articles of Confederation because it was a bit of a mess. Um, and it was such a bit of a mess that in places like Western Massachusetts, there were complete uprisings against government and uh, there wasn't a whole lot the government could do about it, you know? And the Articles of Confederation are one of those foundational documents you need to be aware of. Um, but I'm gonna give you the shorthand on the Articles of Confederation, okay? This was created not to be um, one formal government, but it was created to be a confederation where you have 13 pretty much independent countries, think of it that way, and they all agreed to work together under these articles, all right? Um, but they were all sovereign nations. It's kind of think of the European Union, you know? Each country within the European Union is sovereign and can make its own decisions um, and make its own laws for its people and maybe even decide just to leave if they want to. Um, and, uh, and, and, but they are working together and they have representatives who meet together to try and come up with things they're going to be doing in common, all right? So that's what it is. But in a confederation, there are real weaknesses. And it's the weaknesses of the Articles of Confederation that proved to be a little bit too much. First of all, it was really, really hard to pass laws, okay? They had to have a super majority in order to pass laws. Um, and, uh, and, and because of differences in geography and whatnot, um, and because some states didn't often send rep uh, representatives to the, uh, to the Articles of Confederation Congress, um, it made it really kind of difficult. But there was also no enforcement power. If we think of the three branches of government that we have now, the executive, the legislative, the judicial, like the legislative is there to make the laws, right? But that's like the end of what they do. They make the laws. Then the executive branch is the one who's supposed to execute the laws, carry out the laws, enforce the laws, right? And then the judicial branch provides a place where people can challenge the enforcement of the law or challenge the law itself and then have a judgment made on the constitutionality of the law or whether the law was carried out in the right way or whatever. Well, take out the executive and the ju judicial and what do you have? You have Congress making laws, which are hard to pass anyway. They're making laws and there's no way to enforce them. So yeah, that doesn't, yeah, well, didn't too, prove to be too sustainable. But this next one made it even harder. The, the Articles of Confederation Congress had no power to tax. They could not tax. Now, they could raise money, but what they relied on were voluntary contributions by the different states. And some states just decided not to contribute at times, and other states decided to contribute more, and it was kind of all over the place. You can see, like, there's a problem here. States also were able to act independently because they were pretty much independent countries. States were making their own money. States were enforcing border restrictions against other states and, uh, you know, collecting taxes on goods which were passing between states. Um, states were making uh, uh, treaties with other countries. Um, you know, if Georgia would make a treaty with, you know, some other country or, or something like that. Like, they were all doing their own thing, and it was pretty messy. And there was no centralized military power. They were able to fund the, uh, the, the, the army uh, that fought the Revolutionary War, the Revolutionary Army. Um, but once that was disbanded at the end of the Revolutionary War, there was no central military power. So if they ever needed a military, they had to ask for states to send their militias or their military in on, you know, because they wanted to. Do you see some problems here? Well, the whole thing kind of fell apart. And people realized that, you know, they're, they're, we, we have a problem here, right? Um, and, and the problem is like, we have to, under, we have to decide which, where we're gonna go here. We need something stronger than what we have because the uh, Arts Confederation are not working, but democracy and the ability of the people to have their say is going to be negatively affected the stronger a central government becomes, you know? And I put this picture up here because I think we see this playing out. If you've been watching some of the, uh, 
some of the press conferences, you'll see that there is uh, sort of this disconnect between um, a central government, the, like the push for a central government to be driving all of the decisions around uh, the reaction to the coronavirus. Um, and then you have states and individuals who are saying, you know what, federal government, like we need to be doing this ourselves. I'm gonna jump out of here real quickly, see what I, I have a, another message in the chat here. Um, uh, someone asks, is Adam Smith a base of our capitalist ideology in reference to government? Uh, yeah, shorthand, yeah. You're not gonna need to know a whole lot about economics for this, um, for this uh, exam, but uh, yeah, I mean, think of Adam Smith and, and sort of the free market idea, if you know what that is, um, as being fairly central to, uh, to sort of how we do it, okay? So there's this question over where this should be. Um, you know, uh, President Trump, for example, uh, wants to have schools reopen before the end of the school year. Um, and governors around the states are saying, hey, that's not your call. You're not in charge of the schools in our states. We need to be making those decisions based on what's good for our state, not what's good for, you know, a, or a good for the country or perceived good for the country or something like that, because there can be differences. Maybe North Dakota could open or Alaska could open schools a little bit easier um, than, say, New York, you know. Um, so uh, there are those. So in order to see like the difference between these two things, um, there's a couple of documents that, uh, that you really need to sort of look at. If you haven't looked at these in your courses, what I would suggest is go back and read at least an excerpted version. If you didn't get one in class, um, you know, just Google Fe Federalist number 10 excerpts and, you know, read a short like two or three page thing. You can read the whole thing if you want to, it's not that long, but you know, save a little bit of time. Here's the big idea that was put forth um, in, in Federalist number 10. This is written by James Madison. Um, and in the Federalist, there was an argument for a stronger central government. And the argument uh, was made that if you have a stronger central government, then you create this large republic. And the problem that exists in any sort of representative democracy is uh, the mischiefs of faction, that, the, that there'll be these groups which will form that will oppose each other, and those groups will fight each other for dominance and to push their own agenda, even if it's the, at the expense of the greater good, um, and certainly if it's at the expense of the other, uh, of the other factions, okay? And so in a large republic, it's going to control the mischiefs of faction, sorry, whoops, um, because what it does is it creates such a huge area under one government that there are so many different voices that factions cannot uh, evolve. Plus, the federal government is set up in a way which, which would discourage them. Um, and then, it, he, he argued, this strong central government would delegate authority to elected representatives. So the people would, would elect people who would then make the decision making it harder for these factions to actually get things done, they would have to influence people who were making the decisions, all right? And then also, and we'll talk about this a lot tomorrow, um, the, Fed, the, the uh, central government or the constitution would divide a power between the federal government and the states. Again, we see this in what we're doing or what we're talking about with the COVID-19. I'm gonna jump over here real quickly because I do have a couple of questions coming through from the chat. I just wanna make sure I'm answering this. Um, what Federalist and Brutus papers do we need to know for the test? Great question. Well, Federalist number 10 um, is, is obviously uh, one that you definitely need to know. Um, and I just went through it here and haha, look at this, Brutus number one. Yeah, Brutus uh, is the the papers uh, were written with sort of uh, pen names, um, and and all of the all of the uh, Federalist papers were were titled Publius, and all of the anti-Federalist papers were titled uh, Brutus, and Brutus number one uh, went through and and kind of argued against this strong central government um, because it said democracy is kind of the main thing here, and having a, 
having a larger central government is going to take away from democracy because it's going to dilute the opinions of the people. And he said that if you go back and look at history, and especially if you go back and look at the writings of someone like Montesquieu, that, that small decentralized republics are the best idea because they're more responsive to the needs of the people that they're trying to serve. Think, for example, of, um, of the uh, of, of again what's going on today. Um, I have um, I have uh, uh, Mayor Cuomo from New York here, or Governor Cuomo, Cuomo sorry, uh, from New York here, because he's been making almost not completely, but almost a Brutus-like argument, saying that because New York is New York and not some other place, New York is better served to make the decisions for its people about when to open things up, when to stop social distancing, uh, and those sorts of things. So the states, uh, Brutus argues, are actually best equipped to deal with their own problems. And in a larger republic, especially with a central government, which is going to have a lot of power, um, this, that, the ability of states to do that could be taken away. And in fact, one of the things that, that they brought up that was a big danger was the, uh, the ability of the central government to make almost any laws that they wanted to using the uh, necessary and proper clause, which we'll talk about uh, a little bit later. And basically what he warned about is what's going to suffer here is personal liberty because people working in a larger uh, republic are going to start pushing their own interests because they have the resources of a larger number of people paying a larger amount of taxes, let's say, and they're going to then push their own personal agendas, which might not serve the interests of everybody, but will serve the interests of some people, and they're going to take those, and they're going to push those, and they're going to make themselves wealthy, or they're going to make themselves powerful, or they're going to you know, make themselves happier in some way, and it doesn't necessarily reflect what everybody uh, would want. So those are, are are definitely the two. The other Federalist paper, by the way, that that uh, you're going to need to know is Federalist 51, um, and 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 we'll talk about that uh, a little bit. We're talking about that today. I'm not quite sure. Um, so we go to Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, the summer of 1787, the hot summer of 1787 meeting in this building right behind me um, uh, was the Constitutional Convention. Um, and, you know, the picture here is a little bit overblown, um, not quite uh, accurate. The windows were boarded shut so that they wouldn't uh, be disturbed by people giving them every bit of advice they could possibly uh, come up with or even knowing what was ta being talked about in there. It was hot. It was sweaty. It was, uh, it was, it was not pleasant in the summer. Uh, for those of you who live in the Northeast, you kind of know how hot and humid it can be in the summer. But what arose, and this is like the big idea of the Constitutional Convention, compromise was ultimately what it is. And we're brought up to look at the Constitution and say like, wow, this is this perfect thing. This is this, this magical document brought by these people who, you know, were just like created on earth for this one purpose of creating a perfect society and all this. But really what you have is you have a series of compromises. And the fact that they ended up compromising did two things. Number one, it gave, um, it, it, it created a constitution. Compr without compromise, this wouldn't have worked. Um, but number two, it also created some problems which we have had to deal with in the past and some problems that we're still having to deal with. So the Great Compromise is the first one that you should know. Um, the, uh, oh, let me go back because that's I'm just going to talk about that one. Um, so the Great Compromise, as you I probably remember from going through this, there were two proposals put forth. The Virginia Plan, which called for a, uh, a legislative branch. Um, which was elected by, uh, by population. So states with more population would get more seats in, in uh, Congress and thus have more say in, and more votes when it comes to making laws. Um, it's you know, not surprising that Virginia would come up with this because Virginia was the most populous state in all of the 13 uh, states. So, you know, they would sit there and they would 
they were the ones who were going to benefit the, be the the most. Plus, James Madison was the one who showed up with like a draft constitution. So, you know, you know, it is with a group project. Like when the first person shows up, if they've already done a lot of the work, you don't just throw that aside and start with a clean slate. You look at what they have and you start arguing over what you like and don't like about that. So James Madison genius shows up. It, it's amazing. Um, this was countered on the other side by the New Jersey plan. And under the New Jersey plan, which was really backed by small states, the, the uh, new Congress was going to reflect a little bit more like what they saw in the Articles of Confederation. Each, uh, each state would get an equal number of votes. Um, and so every state had an equal say in making laws. Well, they argued over this for a long time. This was the big one. It was called the Great Compromise. And it, that's what we call it. I mean, don't go to another country and say like, hey, yeah, how about that great compromise, which probably would not be a normal thing you'd say in another country anyway. But anyway, they wouldn't know what you're talking about because, you know, they have their own great compromises. But anyway, in ours, what we decided or what they decided, I keep saying we as if I was like there and you know, I was in there with them. Um, but uh, what they ended up doing is they ended up kind of taking both ideas. They created a uh, Congress that has two houses, the House of Representatives elected by population. There's your Virginia plan right there. And then the Senate, which has equal representation for every state, which is, boom, your New Jersey plan. And in order for a law to pass, it has to go through both of those houses and they both have to agree to it. So they, sort of said, well, let's, how about we just do both? And like, yeah, that'll make everybody unhappy or happy or however, compromises are never perfect. And so there you go. And once that was over, then other things could be talked about because this was the one which really was going to sort of like trash the whole plan for government. They all, another comprom compromise they came up with was the compromise of the electoral college. How do you elect um, the, the president of the United States? And they came up with a system which is so good, no one else uses it in the world. So yeah, and there's been so many plans and, and all of this to try and get rid of it. But uh, what you have is you have um, individual states are given a number of votes for president based on the number of representatives they have in Congress. Um, and then uh, the electors are the ones who actually choose the president of the United States. So that's why you can look at, the, at this map. This map is from uh, 2016, right? And so you've got Clinton in blue and you've got Trump uh, in, in, it's supposed to be red, it's not quite red. But um, then you've got, you know, Spotted Eagle got one uh, electoral vote from Washington, not because the people of Washington voted for Spotted Eagle, but because the elector from that state uh, decided to vote for Spotted Eagle as, uh, you know, a protest vote. Um, and uh, and because and electors, according to the Constitution, can do, can vote for whoever they want to. Let's not get into that whole mess right now, though. But that was a, that was a compromise. Because again, what you see is you see that this is a little bit of, um, you know, it, it national interest being also balanced with the interests of the states. It's not just a straight up popular vote because it was a straight up popular vote, then states which had higher populations would completely run the show. Um, running for president, if you've got California, Texas, um, and, and, and New York with, with a few others, I mean, you'd, you'd run the table on the whole thing. So um, they also came up with the infamous three-fifths compromise when they were talking about how to uh, how to uh, count people for representation. If you're with it, representing people by uh, population, how do you what do you do with slaves? You know, um, and uh, of course, southern states wanted to have slaves counted as as uh, people, and uh, northern states said, well, you know, you, you, you call them property. Um, so we can't count them as people if you're calling them property. And so what they came up with as a compromise, again, you've got to understand this is a compromise, it's not perfect, far from it, is that every state, every slave would count as three-fifths of a person. Um, 
And uh, that was the compromise they made, 60% citizenship, or not even citizenship, just representation. Um, so the question is, um, great compromise led to uh, bicameralism? Yes, absolutely. Um, and, and that's sort of the key to know. So great compromise created that bicameral legislature. Um, and we'll go through all of that um, in a few days, okay? Um, and so then to balance out the three-fifths compromise, there was also a compromise about the importation of slaves um, because uh, states in the North wanted to stop the international slave trade. Um, states in the South um, didn't necessarily wanna keep it, but they didn't wanna like stop it immediately. Um, and so what they put in there was that the slave importation uh, would be, could not be stopped by Congress within or for 20 years is what they said. And then uh, almost immediately when that 20 year deadline came up, the international slave, slave trade was outlawed. Um, again, a compromise. So all of these compromises came together. Now, they also put into this an amendment process and way, a way to be able to change the Constitution when there was a need for the Constitution to be changed. There was a way to change the article, Articles of Confederation, but it required the support of every single state. One state said no, the whole thing fell apart. And so they said, let's create something which is not easy to do, but which is possible to do. Um, and, and, and it's not, you know, and it doesn't require 100% uh, sign on here, right? So, and this is where people get, I, I find really kind of confused. So I, I, let's just lay it out this way. Think of it in two stages, okay? The first stage, first stage represents the national aspect of a government. All of the people of the United States are represented in stage one. And then in stage two, the states are represented, okay? So it's the people and then the states. And they both have to agree on a constitutional amendment in order for it to become part of the constitution, okay? National, then states. And so what they did is they created two phases. The first is the proposal stage, which is done on the national level, all right? Now, the easiest way to do this is to have a two thirds vote in both houses of Congress. There are, Congress already meets. This is just something else they can debate and talk about. The people are already there. Like, you know, every, they, you know they, they know where the bathroom is. I mean, everything's already set up, right? So two thirds vote in both houses proposes a constitutional amendment. But they also said that you could do that if two thirds of the state legislatures proposed uh, a, a a uh, constitutional amendment. Now that has never happened. All of the 27 amendments to the constitution have started off with two thirds vote in both houses. Again, it's just easier um, because the state legislature is going through it again. It's just, it, it gets a little bit messy. Then that constitutional amendment is sent to the states and the states have to ratify it. They have to agree to it, um, but they don't all have to agree. Keep in mind, I mean, look at the proposal, two thirds, not easy to come by in both houses but it's not impossible, right? With the states, they upped the ante more uh, than that. Three quarters of the state legislatures, these being the, the House and Senate in each state, um, had to ratify or have to ratify an amendment for it to be part, part of the constitution. Or they said, if you don't wanna use state legislatures, you can call state conventions uh, you know, create a convention in each state. And then those conventions, if three quarters of the state conventions ratify the constitution, then it be, or ratifies the amendment, then it becomes part of the constitution. Um, and 26 of the 27 have uh, gone through the state legislatures. Again, it's just easier, you know, people like conventions and, you know, it's nice to get out of town and, you know, go to the state capitol, you know, here in Pennsylvania, we don't come here. We go to lovely Harrisburg, um, you know, um, but it's messy and it's just like, bah, no. The only reason you would do it is if you knew that the state legislatures probably wouldn't ratify the, con uh, ratify the amendment. And so it was done one time. And that was for the 21st Amendment, which, um, which got rid of prohibition. 
Um, they were afraid that elected representatives in state legislatures weren't going to actually uh, uh, ratify that amendment, but the people wanted their alcohol. So the people had state conventions, and it's the only time that that amendment has ever passed that way. Okay, so two phases, national, uh, state. Probably you've seen some sort of graphic like this, you know, and I, I this can either make it easier for you if you're one of those visual people, or this can make it more confusing because you go like, but you have I don't know at all. You know, um, it's, yeah, just however you like it. Think, think national, then state, think proposal, then ratification. Okay. Now, there are certainly ongoing debates here. Okay. There's a lot of issues that have, that had, were, had needed to be resolved. Um, some which weren't even kind of uh, put together in uh, the constitution or in the constitution itself. You know, some of these things we're still debating over that. You know, um, how far can the federal government uh, uh, push for schools to reopen or push for businesses to reopen and get us out of our homes and back uh, to normal lives? And and how much do states have the ability to make that decision uh, for themselves. Um, and, and, you know, it's, it's a debate which is playing out on television almost every single day. Um, it's that role of the national government versus the role of the states. Um, the national government, we'll see tomorrow, certainly has a lot of things going for it. It has a lot of money. Um, it has a lot of uh, power. It has a lot of resources. It has a lot of people working for it. Um, you know, there's a lot there. Um, but there are certainly things that, that are maybe better handled by states because they may reflect more of a, um, uh, of a local flavor. In fact, let's just take a moment and think about the situations that all of us are in um, in school. Schools are institutions of the state. They are run by the state. Therefore, some states are going to fund education more than other states. Some states are going to uh, have different graduation requirements than other states. Some states are going to have, um, you know, it, it, it can be different all over the place. And so, it, you know, there can be different uh, courses offered and there can be different uh, all kinds of that. But then there's a national side to it, too, where a number of people think that it, it would be a good idea to, to move towards a model like, let's say, the United Kingdom has, where there's one national curriculum and every single student in the country would be learning the same things at the same time, in the same grade. Um, and, and we're seeing not really a governmental uh, creation of that, but no, I don't care where you where you are right now in watching this, whether you're in Maine or Florida or California or Kansas, it doesn't matter. You're going to take the same test and it's the same test based on the same material. Now, this is not a mandated thing. The college board created it itself, but it is kind of it does kind of create a national curriculum so that teachers of AP government can communicate across state lines because they're teaching the same things pretty much at the same time. Um, and so you can see some of that. Um, there's also uh, the, the question of the rights of individuals. Um, when do our rights or how far do our rights extend? When is it okay to take away our rights in the name of most often safety? Um, probably everyone watching this is too young to remember a day when you when you'd go to the airport and not have to go through intense security procedures um, where the, you know you're holding your arms above your head and all of that. But prior to 9/11, there was uh, there were metal detectors and sometimes uh, people would search your bag, you know, just look through it for things and you know maybe there would be sort of security dogs around but um you know certainly nothing like what we're seeing today and we gave up a lot of our freedom because we felt hey you know what we don't want to have another 9-11 happen we we think that's more important the security line became a thing 
believe it or not, before 9-11, people used to meet, like when people were arriving on an airplane, people would go right to the gate and meet them when they walked off the airplane. Those were those kind of good days. Yeah. Now you got to get out of security and all of that. We also debate the limits of national power. What can the federal government do? And when is the federal government overreaching itself and starting to infringe on maybe our rights, maybe the rights of the states, maybe the powers of the states? Um, could President Trump issue an order to, <clears throat> excuse me, to open back up the economy? Or is that overreach of national power? Um, so those debates are continuing uh, as we go along. So we move on to our next idea here. Um, I'm going to have to pick this up just a little bit. Um, Constitution created a competitive policymaking process to ensure the people's will is represented and that freedom is preserved. This is competitive policymaking, competing interests trying to do different things. And so they put into the Constitution some different, uh, some, some sort of big ideas, separation of powers, separated them out between the legislative, the judicial and the executive. And they very specifically in the constitution laid out exactly the powers they were, they were giving to each of those branches. Um, that makes it harder for one faction, if we're talking about James Madison, to uh, get all of its interests taken care of because there's, it has to go through different uh, parts of the government. They also created a system of checks and balances where, the, uh, where one branch of government can stop the actions or, or at least hinder the actions of other branches of government. If Congress passes a law and the president doesn't like it, the president can veto that law and boom, it's done because the two thirds override vote doesn't happen very often, but it's done. If the president starts to enact a law and it's done in a way that the uh, that the courts think is is in violation of the constitution. They can rule that the way it's being enforced is uh, is incorrect, or Congress could change the law or write a new law which outlaws the way it's being in the, that law was being enforced. So each branch has a check on uh, on the other branches. And this is where we come to Federalist number 51, okay? You have here a great picture uh, from uh, the ruling of Brown versus uh, Board of Education in 1954. Um, and in Federalist number 51, what James Madison argued is that the Constitution as laid out, it controls the abuses of a majority over a minority. Now, when you talk majority minority, think just numbers, we're not talking about minorities in the colloquial sense that we that uh, you know they, they're referred to um, uh, you know in America but any abuse by the majority is going to be controlled by the Constitution because it complicates things to have to get through separation of powers and checks and balances um, there's too many blocks to stop a bad idea from happening uh, one of the things these guys really feared, because they were all wealthy landowners who wrote the Constitution, they feared the majority of people who were not wealthy and probably weren't landowners, at least not significant landowners. So what's to stop all of the vast majority of people, you know, the 99 percent, if you will, from making laws to just take away the wealth and the land of the of the one percent and redistribute it to the other 99 percent a la robin hood you know well separation of powers and checks and balances are going to mess that up because it can get stopped in lots of different ways um but it doesn't just have to be landowners it can be any sort of majority minority situation um and then because of the power of a legislative branch to be able to um to uh, uh, make the laws, they, the Constitution divides it in half, which further controls its power, especially if you have a situation like we have today, where we have um, a, a House of Representatives of one party, uh, majority Democrat, and a Senate, which is uh, run by the other party, majority Republican, um, they are going to have to sit down and compromise on things because if the Democrats in Congress start just passing laws through uh, Democrats in the House, let me be more specific, just start passing through Democratic 
like laws and they pass them up to the Senate, the Senate will just vote them down or not vote on them at all because they're majority Republican and they would just say, oh, we don't agree with this. Um, and then nothing gets done. So those sides have to come together. And so Federalist 51 is really an argument for why checks and balances and separation of powers makes for a more effective government, which is gonna better serve the people and put a stop to um, the interests or, or the, the people taking too much power the way uh, Brutus number one thought they might. So think of it as almost like, like pitting, uh, uh, pitting ambition versus ambition. If everyone's ambitious, but you put them in a situation where they have to compromise with each other, then their own ambitions will be the thing that prevent them from doing things which are bad for the other side or bad for the people. You know, you pit ambition against ambition. And that is the key. All right, so as it came around then, the, 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 uh, the Constitutional Convention finished it all up and they wrote up their constitution and they sent it out to be ratified by the states. Um, and so what started happening is there was a division which, which formed in the country between what became known as federalists, those people who wanted a strong federal system, a strong central government um, with state powers, and anti-federalists who um, had opposition to this. Now, it's easy to think of the anti-federalists as like non-patriots and all. Don't, don't think of it that way because the anti-federalists were in no way saying we shouldn't have a constitution and they were in no way saying that we shouldn't have a stronger constitution. That's, you know, that's sort of how they're painted as you know, like they were the one who didn't want America. No, what they said is the constitution as it is written in these words, not good enough. We want something else. And they ended up being kind of right about some things, all right? So the Federalists came out, they supported the ratification of the new constitution. Um, and their big argument was that whole idea of if you have this really large republic, it guards against the power of factions. So the democracy side, where a faction of the majority could do whatever it wanted to, to a minority faction, um, is taken away because there'd be so many factions with so many different interests in a large republic that they're going to, they're not going to be able to uh, uh, sort of pull together and, and, and uh, you know, create those sort of factions. It also puts in effect, put in effective limits on the power of the government. It listed specifically in the constitution, lists specifically in the constitution, what the powers of each branch of government are. So, uh, you know, those things are, are, are there. And they put together these series of Federalist papers. Um, and these are a collection of essays, as you can see here on the right, a collection of essays which are written to tell everybody, basically explain why this Constitution is like an awesome idea and, and you know, the state should ratify it. Um, and, uh, you know, especially when you're looking at the federal papers, Federalist Papers, number 10, the big one, um, number 51 is, is, uh, is the other one, which is really important for today. Now, they're opposed by the people who become known as the Anti-Federalists. They don't name themselves Anti-Federalists, by the way. That name was kind of given to them. And they oppose the Constitution. Again, they were not against the idea of a unified United States of America. What they didn't like was the Constitution in the exact way that it was written. They thought there were too many problems with the wording and the compromises had created situations which were gonna be problematic. And we kind of like say no to this one and maybe we can go back to the drawing board and you know, we can get some other things uh, come up with. Um, they, their, their biggest ideas, again, the centralized government can't represent the varied interests of people. The interests of people in different parts of the country are gonna be different, different climates, different traditions different, uh, um, well, at the time, different uh, views on uh, slavery, you know? Um, the, the, the central government wasn't gonna be able to really represent those interests very well. And so to give it too much power, but kind of their overarching, and, and I think their most effective argument, but I, I definitely their most effective argument, there were no guarantees of citizens' rights against government overreach. In other words, 
in the Constitution, it laid out the powers of different branches of government. And it said, if you've looked at it, you know, Congress has the ability to do this and this and this and this and this. The president has the ability to do this and this and this and this and this. But they said, hey, there's no like, there's no place where citizens' rights to, I don't know, um, speech, religion, press, assembly, you know, those sorts of things. Um, the, those rights are nowhere protected. Um, and so they called for those, you know, something to be put in there. Um, and, you know, I mean, again, if you go back and you look at Brutus number one, you'll see most of the anti-federalist arguments in there. There were a number of them, um, but, uh, but, but that's kind of the big one. And so what ended up happening, oh, spoiler alert, ladies and gentlemen, they actually did ratify the Constitution. Yes, yes. Every, uh, every state ended up coming out and signing on. Um, Rhode Island took a while, but everyone else kind of did it. Um, yeah, we have a lot of people. I'll talk about the essays um, in, in, in a minute. And just as sort of like a spoiler alert, I guess, um, because I see a lot of questions coming up about the argumentative essays and the test itself. Um, and and I, I do wanna, want to want to talk about that. Um, I'm going to kind of save that for the end. I want to get through the ideas and then um, at the end we'll talk about sort of specifically how you're going to be taking the test and those sorts of things. Um, so implications of all of this, okay? What we have now is we have a government that has multiple access points. In other words, people can try and get their voice heard or groups can try and get their voice heard in the House of Representatives. They can have their voices heard uh, through the judicial system. They can influence the way that, uh, that government agencies carry out policy. Um, they can, uh, you know, there's lots and lots of different ways um, that public policy and, and what we do as a country can be influenced by uh, individuals and groups. There are a lot of allowances against the abuse of power. We have mechanisms in place in case elected representatives uh, abuse their power for personal gain or something like that, treason against their own country, whatever it might be. Um, one of these is impeachment. And, you know, it, every year before this one, I've had to talk all the way back to Nixon to talk about, you know, or, sorry, to Clinton. Uh, to talk about, uh, you know, an, an impeachment. This year we saw one, um, and uh, the President of the United States was impeached by the House of Representatives. Here's, here's that actually happening, because they believed that the President had um, abused his power. Um, but them impeaching the President doesn't mean that the President is removed from office. And, uh, and, and so their impeachment, uh, uh, findings were sent to the Senate where the trial was held and the senators were the ones who would vote whether or not to remove the president. It was a foregone conclusion long before the House of Representatives ever drew up the articles of impeachment um, that this wasn't going to happen because it would take a, a two-thirds vote in the Senate, which is majority Republican. So a Republican president is just not going to happen. Um, but those things are in place. Um, and although we've never had a president removed from office for, uh, for things that he did while in office, um, we have had four presidents who've been impeached. Um, the one that's kind of the tricky one is Richard Nixon because they were preparing the articles of impeachment um, when he resigned as president. Chances are, he was going to get removed by the Senate. Um, but then he kind of like took the, took the quick way out and, you know, uh, ran for the door. And, uh, and, and then you know, now we sit here and say, well, that's never actually happened. Um, let's see. Uh, James has a question. Are the anti-federalists and federalists both part of the aristocratic republic, the first party system? Um, I wouldn't worry about party systems, first of all. Um, the, in fact, I've never actually seen a question on an AP government exam that dealt with the party systems, uh, the historical party systems. Um, 
but uh, no, they would involve they they would evolve into um, the Federalists and the Jeffersonian uh, Democrats. Um, uh, not along the exact lines, but um, you know they, they they were similar people. No, the the Federalists and Anti Federalists were only organized, and this is kind of like. How do I put this? The founders never really predicted things like political parties. They didn't see them actually being created. What they envisioned was more like what you had with um, with Federalists and Anti-Federalists. Like they were two sides that formed, but they formed really just around one thing. And then as soon as that thing was decided, then like, you know, they they pretty much broke apart. Like there were no more, although the party that was created uh called themselves federalists but it you know people can call themselves whatever they want to it just they were trying to make history teachers you know pull their hair out and history students sit there and go like what i don't get it yeah that's what they did that for little known fact um okay so we uh we, we've gone an hour and um tomorrow night we're gonna be talking about federalism all right guys i ran through a lot today um, hopefully you got a little bit out of this. Um, hopefully some of the ideas that, uh, that, that you talked about in class have been clarified or reviewed, or maybe you just are sitting there going like, oh yeah, I remember that. Um, and hopefully these help. As I told you at the beginning of this, uh, of this webcast, this is the first of nine nights we're doing um, to get you ready for the AP government exam. Um, so night one is a wrap, ladies and gentlemen. Tomorrow night, federalism oh yes here we are driving on route 66 um exemplifying the idea of federal versus state power all right so hey thanks for stopping in um thank you to the bill of rights institute for uh for creating these uh webcasts uh my name is paul Sargent, and i hope you have a great night and i hope to see you tomorrow all right take care <laughs>